I'd really like to hear this song. Well, God had already put it on the set list. If you don't know Jesus, there's not a sinner that he can't save. And we're going to tell you about him right now. Please stand.
church. Amen. 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 Jesus on the throne. Listen. If it would have just been you, God would have sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Willing to leave the 99 to find the one that was lost. That was me. If you don't know him today, good news. Today is the day of salvation. You can be lost to be found today. God loves you so much, so much, so much. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Worship him, church. Be grateful for the life. For I spoke the word, you were singing all over me. You have been so, so
your soul. Satan wants to seek and destroy. Jesus wants to save and give eternal life. Amen. We've got the choice. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good job. Jesus, just thank you for being here. If we can have some mushrooms come forward. We'll just keep right on praising Jesus through our tithes and offerings and our Operation Joy commitments. The Spirit of the Lord has filled this place. And I love it when it overflows out the doors and into the parking lot and out on 23. As the people drive by, they're saying, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the sweetest name I know. Let's pray, Father, we love you. It's good to be in your house today, Jesus. Singing praise and worship to you. The only God that could save us. The only God that can cleanse us and the only God that can keep us. And Lord, as we pass the offering place this morning, we've got a chance to place our tithes and our offerings and our Operation Joy commitments into the basket, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for blessing our homes, blessing our children, blessing our families, blessing us with jobs, blessing us with cars, blessing us with housing. We thank you for all those blessings. The Lord right now. We thank you, Lord, for this congregation that has come together in the name of Real Joy Community Fellowship. Lord, bless and use this congregation for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Take this offering, Lord, and bless it and multiply it like only you can do. Amazing things you have done, amazing things you are doing, and amazing things you will continue to do. We trust you, we believe you, and we honor you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.
Isn't it good to be in a church where the spirit is alive and well? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Children, you can be dismissed to the joy zone. A lot of amazing things happen in the joy zone. We thank all of those that are serving there, letting their light shine. There's a bunch of them going in there. Hallelujah. Yes, he said we need to be in prayer for our workers and the children to join us. There's a bunch of them out there. Amen. If you love the Lord, say amen. Amen. If you love Pastor Tony, say amen. Amen. You got it, brother. Amen. Good job, Mark. Good job, praise team. <laughs> To God be glory. I'm telling you what, I don't know if you saw that exodus of children leave, but my goodness, be praying for the joy zone this morning, okay? I'm guessing probably close to 40 children. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remember whenever we took those balls out and people said, Pastor, we only got four kids. And I'm like, yeah, but they say build it and they will come. And praise the Lord for that. Hey, it's good seeing everybody here today. We're going to take a couple of weeks off of Rev the book of Revelation. I'll be back in the study of Revelation. And today's the 14th, so we'll be the uh, 28th. I'll be back on uh, chapter 11. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, the seventh trumpet. That's where we're at. Okay, we're walking through that verse by verse. It's been 19 weeks we've been walking through that, and we're in chapter 11. We'll get there within the next couple of years. But anyway, <laughs> God's good, right? Today, uh, I have a, a gentleman, him and his wife here today, uh, Dr. Rich Halcom. He's our associational missionary. Uh, he's the reason why we're here. And I say that, and he says, oh, no, it's not me, it's you. And uh, we both say, it's God. And then it's working through you. No, it's working through it's, it's one of those things where, uh, truly and honestly, we would not be here as a church planner unless this man uh, met with me and said, okay, I believe God's got his hand on you. Let's do this. And uh, he was crazy enough to agree. And so him and his wife have been fantastic. So uh, he's actually going to preach today. And so come back next week. And uh, But you're in for a good one. I've had people this morning. Uh, talk about his sermon, how it touched him so much already. When you have someone say, man, I've been praying about that all week, about being all in. And I'm not trying to steal your thunder, but I say, God's perfect timing. God's yeah. perfect timing. So I want to open up the prayer, and then even though uh, I'm not preaching, we're still going to raise our swords, okay? Yeah. We're ready to go into battle. So let's pray. Father God, I come to you right now. I just thank you so much for today, just a time of worship. And music have been brought to your throne. Father, our hearts and our minds are prepared, praising you for doing the things that you're doing and what you're doing in our lives. But Father, I know you want more, you expect more, Father. And so what we're trying to do now is to continue to grow in you. And so today, Father, it's not by accident that we are here. We have a divine appointment with you to hear your word preached. So Father, I ask that you would have your hand upon my brother, Dr. Rich. Father, be with each individual here today. Right now, I'm just asking you to just pause their mind to forget about what's going on outside, what's going on this past week. But right now, just to focus on you and your word. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit, where your word says we're two or more gathered, there, you're there with us, with us. And so, Father, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit moves in this room, preparing the hearts and the minds to receive the word. Father, I know we have people in here whose hearts are hurting, who are going through some tough times, those who are struggling physically, mentally, and Father, just going through life and struggling. I'd ask that you would just pick them up and be the almighty comforter that you are, that only you can be. Father, be with us now. Be with Dr. Rich. We thank you for him and what he means to me personally. We love you and we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you're visiting here today, come on up, Dr. Rich, come on up. If you're visiting today, we always do this. We hold our swords up, our Bibles, ready to go in. People hold up their electronics, too. You can raise it up, all you smart. Yeah, okay, Brenda's got hers up. 
The guys are on the phone, you're fast, okay. And I always say, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word proceeds out of the house of God. And I ask you this, do you believe that? Yes. Amen. We cannot live by bread alone, although it's pretty good, right? Hey, K. Baddies. Yeah, hey, you go out to that fair food, right? But this is the sweetest word right here, Amen. God's word. And so this is Dr. Rich Hockham. I appreciate him. Love him so much. Would you guys give him a warm welcome? <laughs> fantastic. Oh, fantastic being here with you. So if you have the Bible, go ahead and open it to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. So I bring you greetings from your 143 sister churches and Metro Columbus Baptist Association. We're starting to call it Strategic Church Network because a lot of our churches aren't in Metro Columbus, like Real Joy, right? Uh, so God has added 17 churches this year, which is amazing, giving us a North Campus uh, this past January. So we did a backpack giveaway at both locations yesterday. The last year at the South location, we helped 333 kids last year. This year, 615 kids because God gave us that other property, right? 23,000 square feet, a mission house in the back, out-of-town mission groups can stay. But you guys know what that's like as God continues to move and to grow and to see new people. Amen. It's an honor to be here and to see how God has grown Real Joy Community Church over the past 14 years. Um, I've been around since the beginning and praying for Pastor Tony and appreciate his leadership. And God wants to do that everywhere, but he looks for men equipped, called, uh, anointed by him to do it, and that's what he's doing. Amen. And just see this next step of the new facility, and just amazing, right? It's, um, it, it's like Moses at the burning bush sometimes, isn't it? Right? Where you see what God is doing, and then he sends you out. So today's message is about that. It's about recognizing what God is doing through your church, but at a deeper level, recognizing that he wants to do the very same thing in your life. The things that he sees in us as a whole, the church as a whole, corporately, he wants to do in your life individually. So Deuteronomy chapter 1, as you may know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So those are Hebrew books written in Hebrew, but with Greek names. So Genesis means the beginning, since that's where it starts, in the beginning, God created. Right, the second book of the Bible, Exodus, that's a Greek word, you have two words, ek, hadas, which means the road out or the way out, because Exodus is a story of the children of Israel leaving Egypt, right? And then there's Leviticus, talks about the Levites, how to become holy, uh, the ceremony that attaches to that. The book of Numbers is written because they encountered a whole bunch of things. I heard some people say you shouldn't count people. Well, nobody told Moses that when he wrote the book of Numbers, or the Holy Spirit that when he inspired it. But then we come to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos, means the second law. I know you know the Ten Commandments because you're a member here, you go here, and you've heard God's word preached. So the Ten Commandments shows up in Exodus chapter 20, but it shows up a second time in the book of Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy chapter 5. That's part of the reason it's called the second law, Deuteronomos. So we're going to start here in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and see how it is that God wants to apply this to our lives. So starting with verse 1, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah opposite, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. It is an 11-day journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by way of Mount Seir. Notice what it says there. In the 40th year... 11 months on the first of the month, Moses told the Israelites everything the Lord had commanded him to say to them. So they took an 11-day journey in 40 years. Isn't that crazy? Verse 4. This was after he had defeated King Sihon of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and King Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth at Edra. Across the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying, verse 6, The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. Resume your journey and go to the hill country. So you may remember the story of Moses that wrote the book of Deuteronomy, how the first 40 years of his life, 
he spent growing up in the house of Pharaoh the king. Remember, he was born in Hebrew, and they were not in power. The Egyptians were in power. Uh, his mom put him in a, an ark of bulrushes, a little boat, and the Pharaoh's daughter found him. Spent 40 years in the palace of Pharaoh with the world's best education, by the way. That's how he knew how to write the first five books. Well, then the second 40 years, he spent on the backside of the desert. He killed an Egyptian when he was about 40 years old, ran for his life, spent 40 years out in the wilderness, kind of tending sheep. At the end of that, at about age 80, he comes across this burning bush. Uh, you may have read about it, may have heard about it. So it was a bush that was on fire, but it didn't burn down. Maybe. And God used that to call him to go back to Egypt to free his people, to lead his people. But then kind of what's happened over the years is that place where the burning bush was, they built a monastery. They built a, a place, there it is right there. So the burning bush, the, the type of bush it is, can last decades and centuries, and it has. So they built a monument to the burning bush. So it takes about three hours to climb the 7,498-foot peak following the path of Moses. It's a stairway about 4,000 steps just to get to that bush. And it's called the Chapel of the Burning Bush. Now, why would they do that? Because at one point in time, God used that burning bush in the life of Moses for a deep, incredible, life-changing spiritual experience, right? But how many burning bushes are there in the Bible? One. They're trying to recreate the past by hanging around the bush, and it doesn't work like that. Sure. Right? God's first instruction is to move away from the mountain. So your church is doing that. Pastor Tony moved away from a very successful career and went in ministry and then planted a church. He kept, he, he kept moving away from those mountains, and look what God has done. So the people that have been reached here, the people baptized, you have a new deacon being ordained, 40 kids in the kid zone, never would have happened if Pastor Tony would have stayed at the bush. Hallelujah. Same is true of you. God does something in your life, speaks to you in a way where it, it, you can almost hear his voice. And you know that you know that you know that God moved in your life at that very instant. The mistake is to stay there. You see, God does not recreate those kinds of things. What we want is comfortability. We want to be able to, well, yeah, if I just go back and work this formula, God will work like that. It doesn't work like that. Do you know why it doesn't work like that? Because that takes no faith. I'm going to hang around at the bush. Well, it's hard climbing those three hours up those 7,500 steps. Well, that's hard. That's not what he's asking you to do. You can do, do as much as you want, but it's not going to work. Because he wants you to exercise the same faith for the next step that it took you on that step. That's the point. That he wants to develop you, but that only happens when you move away from that mountain. So we know that the children of Israel, as they're on that journey out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea on dry land, right? How many times did the children of Israel cross the lake, the Red Sea on dry land? Once. Some people want to go back to the, the banks of the Red Sea. Waiting on God. <coughs> waiting on God to part the Red Sea. He already did that. He's doing, God's, over, God's waiting on you. You're not waiting on God. He's waiting for you to recognize that that moment in time should not be a monument that that moment was to get you to take that first step so that after you take that first step, you will see the next step that God wants you to take. What happens to us and a lot of uh, church-type folks is we want to see the whole thing mapped out before we're willing to take the step. Yeah. Yeah. So I was meeting with a church. They used to average 150 or so back in the day. They were down to 12 people, average attendance. According to their constitution, they're supposed to have 19 committees. Minutes. That is a hammer. So here's what they said. We want to be absolutely sure what God wants us to do. I said, well, then forget it. You'll never do anything. Never happen. God doesn't work like that. You rarely see the second step 
until after you've taken the first step. The, first, the second step may be around the corner that you could not see before you took that first step. And then he wants you to take the next step. Right? So that building that I said was donated to us, good news, so thought it cost about $650,000 to fix that thing up. Probably going to be about $1.1 million, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll get the final numbers here a, a week from tomorrow. But couldn't have seen that until I took the first step. Right, we're in. We have the building, we own it, transferred the deed. Oh, it's like, oh, the macro, I didn't know that. Didn't know a roof in Columbus would cost $187,000. First bid we got was $243,000. Now, if we would have known all that here, I think part of the reason God doesn't pay it, you, you may have never done that, yeah. right? But now we're in. We're already out there in the water. There's no going back. So what does that mean? That means... I need to trust God again. Sooner and bigger than I was thinking, Amen. but because God is calling us to a larger purpose. Amen. Same is true of you. What is the mountain that you've made into a monument? Well, I just love my Sunday school class. We have such fellowship in there. We bring the best food. I, I saw a church uh, newsletter a while back recognize this woman, 90 years old, who'd been teaching the same four, four ladies for 40 years. I would not put that in the church newsletter. That's not, that's not that great. Right? That's better than for being at the bar or something, right? But she's 90, I don't know. But what I wanted to see is this woman is 90 years old teaching these four ladies, and she started these 20 other Sunday school classes over the years. That she's equipped all these other leaders to go out and multiply. Right? Because when you move away from the mountain, what God wants you to do is to move toward the masses. So we see here in verses 7 and 8. It says, I've said to you at that time, I can't bear the responsibility uh, for you on my own. The Lord your God has so multiplied you that today you are as numerous as the stars of the sky. But look at verse 11. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousand times more and bless you as he promised you. You see, the reason God gives you that increase is so that then forms the platform for you to take the next step. That's right. Amen. It's not just to have a church that's full of people, right? It's to have a church that's full of people who are reaching thousands of people. Amen. So as you move into that new place, and even now, you know, I think Chilla County has about 22,000 people, a lot more in Ross County. Right? And you radiate well beyond that. That's the point of the exercise. For God to use you beyond you. But you move away from the mountain, and then you multiply the masses. And often you have to put yourself in a place of desperation for yourself before God can use you. So before I came to Central Ohio about 19 years ago now, I was at a church in Texas, averaged 5,000 in worship, I had 10 full-time ministers, 150 employees. We had 221 Sunday school classes, 3,321 people every week. Lived in a house with a sprinkler system. I didn't have to take my garbage to the curb. They came to my back door twice a week and got it. New school, hired the principal, hired the best teacher. I grew up in abject poverty on Buffalo Creek Road down in Chesapeake. This was like, wow. I left that. We just built a $28 million facility, 2,400 feet worship center. I left at to take over a struggling network of churches in central Ohio with an office in White House. Somebody shot there last week, you know, inner city area. So I'm, I'm, I'm in, in my office in Texas had two kinds of carpet because I was executive staff, right? There, <laughs> it had carpet. The, the roof was leaking, you know, winter rain, you get water on my books. And, had a pastor, Daryl Davis, from Mountain Creek, get up and look on the roof. He said, well, you got a lot of nail pop up. But that, he said, well, that's a slug. There's a slug from a 357 in the roof. Go on one day, they can't find a garbage can. They so cross the street, somebody's sleeping under them. And we cut away some bushes. They found a loaded uh, 22 with a scope on it. Some homeless guy felt threatened at 100 yards, I guess. Um, I went in one uh, Sunday afternoon. I was on my way to Bloom Baptist to do a leadership training Sunday night. And I hear this commotion in the back, so I look out the window, 
There's a guy ripping the downspout off of the building. Ripping. Yeah, aluminum. He's going to step. The first thing I did, I looked out, make sure he didn't have a gun. He was wadding it up and turning on his bike. Said, what are you doing with it? I said, you take that off that stuff. Well, let's rip it. Give me that. <laughs> Why did I leave Houston for that? <laughs> it was this passage. This passage is this. You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. I knew that the churches that I'd been in this association before didn't know how to do church the way they knew how to do church in, when I was in Texas. It's not that God loves churches in Texas more. It's not that they're smarter than people in Central. It's just the way they do things. So that's what I've done when I came back. I saw it at then the 15th largest city, now the 14th largest city, what God can do. He's added 17 churches this year. Given us a million and a half dollar property. Helped twice the number of kids with backpacks. That never would have happened in my life if I had not moved away from the mountain to multiply the masses. Right. Yeah, yeah. The same is true of you. When you stay with you where you are, you can't go with God. He's moving. He wants to multiply. He wants to make disciples of all nations. We worship in our 144 churches. 16 languages every Sunday. Here in Ohio, Sunday Ohio. Isn't that incredible? A bunch of Nepali folks that love Jesus and they've moved, moved away from the mountain to multiply the masses. So how can God multiply you? So it may be that you're not a believer. It may be that you're still wondering. I don't know about that. No. It's always a risk. Always a risk. If you know 100% for sure, it's not faith. It's not a risk. But God wants you to be saved. It says it. It's God's will that not any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's what he wants. Amen. Now the question, you want to do it or not, that's on you. But it's not a question of what he wants. And then once you come to Christ, he wants to use you to multiply the masses. Right? You, we make disciples or he can use us to make disciples. So it may be getting involved in a ministry. Or it may be attending a small group for the first time. Right? Or maybe it's that you're already a leader. How can God multiply you if you're a leader? And I, years ago, I was teaching my class and trying to do everything I wanted to do. And it's like, Lord, how can I make a bigger impact in the kingdom? Right? As far as I know, I'm totally surrendered to you. No one confessed sin. We tithe, we fast, pray. That's why I said that kind of stuff. And then it's like God said, who are you taking with me? God. So what I started doing, and about anything I do, I'll call somebody to go with me. I don't do it by myself. I got to call 1 o'clock in the morning. Somebody had died. So what did I do? I called a deacon. Somebody asked me, you called a deacon at 1 o'clock in the morning? They called me at 1 o'clock in the morning. Come on. He went with me. And he loved it. So if you're already in ministry, you're already leading in ministry, the way you multiply the masses is by inviting somebody else into your world. You don't have to do a whole bunch of extra work. You, know, you don't have to figure out some old training. Some, just let them do what you're doing. So as a Sunday school teacher, I had somebody come, and I would show them how to study for a lesson. Didn't take me any extra time, but help them and let them teach a little bit in the lesson, that kind of thing, right? So you don't, not labor intensive, it just has to be intentional. Multiply the masses. Well, how do you do that? You have to develop spiritually. So you notice the one that uh, Moses called. It says that they were wise. Wise. So if you look in the Bible at Jesus, Luke chapter 2, he was born, right? The decree went out from Caesar Augustus, all the world should be taxed, Luke chapter 2. Well, near the end of Luke chapter 2, he's 12 years old in the temple. So in the last verse of Luke chapter 2, so, so you have his birth. Beginning of Luke 2, end of Luke 2, he's 12 years old. Luke 3 opens, prologue John the Baptist, and then Jesus is 30 years old when he starts his ministry. So from his birth, 12 years old, 30 years old. So at age 12, it says Jesus did four things. He increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with others. That's what I did. That's my, my goals are built on that. To increase in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with others. So my increase in wisdom is a continual yielding to God Almighty. And as a matter of fact, the great commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
right? It's the same as those four things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's favorable with people. All your soul. That's favorable with God. All your strength. That's uh, uh, yeah, stature. Thanks. Stature, physically speaking. And then all your mind, that's the mental, that's the wisdom. So as you do that, you increase in wisdom. So all of you who are leaders, all of you who are teachers, know that you learn a lot more about God. You're, you're a deeper disciple when you're leading than you are when you're listening. Right? If I'm just in a class, I'm enjoying the class, I'm comfortable. That's not the point. It, is there anywhere in the Bible, so I've read it all, 775,000 words approximately, that's the NIV version, not what this one is, but does the Bible ever say, are you comfortable? No. So with Job, right, still had his wife, God about killed him physically, took away his kids, took away his livestock, everything else. You know. God never said, Job, do you feel okay about that? Never. To Moses. To Moses, burning bush. So Moses left Egypt because he had killed an Egyptian and was running for his life because they figured they'd want to kill him, so they murdered someone. So after that 40 years, God says, go back to the place where the king's trying to kill you, the Pharaoh. It wasn't, do you feel okay about this, Moses? Does this sound like a good plan to you? Are you there? Never. Your growth is not inside your comfort. Your growth is getting outside of where you're comfortable because that's where God intervenes. Amen. The principle I live by is that you should always be doing something for God that will fail if he does not intervene. Maybe teaching a class where I've never stood up in front of anybody before. Here's your opportunity. I've never served before. I've never cooked food for that many people at a church at Here's your opportunity. And the truth is, nobody ever knows how to do it until they're done. Right? So I used to work with my dad on trucks. Uh, he was a mechanic, worked on diesel trucks. He's an international harvester, kind of cab over. I knew how to do a few things because he'd show me. I knew how to hold a flashlight, right? <laughs> I didn't know how to work on those trucks, pull the wheels, change the oil, brakes, fuel injectors. I didn't know how to do any of that until I started doing it. Right? You don't know how to teach until you start teaching. And you can study it, and you should, and there are things you need to know. Um, when I was in college, I took a class in swimming because I couldn't swim. It, it, when I went to college, everybody had to take a swim test as part of freshman orientation. So I jumped in. I go about six feet, like, I'm going to die, right? So doing this elementary swimming class went on for the, ended up becoming a lifeguard. So part of the class, we would sit in the class and study the book on swimming, right? So breaststroke. Like an inverted heart. Now, what I'm doing right now, does that convince you that I know how to swim? No. What do you do? Get in the pool. That's where you learn how to swim. My dad used to say, you know, somebody can read a book like the Chilton's or whatever, how to fix a car, but they still don't know how to do it if they've never done it. That's the way it all works. That's the way God wants to work in your life for you to do it. To move away from the mountain, not to make a monument out of the moment, but then to multiply the masses through God's influence in your life and what it is that he wants to accomplish through you. We do that by developing spiritually, but then also by accepting responsibility. So here's the downside. Here's what Right? There we go back. So what happens if you don't do that? There is a downside. It's not that you either risk straight for God or your life just kind of goes merrily along. So here's an anatomy here. Here's a diagram of a spiritual disaster. Verse, uh, verse 26 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. So here's the first step. 
of a spiritual disaster. But you were not willing to go up. Right? You don't have to do anything bad. It's not that you're doing something wrong. The first step to a spiritual disaster is an unwillingness to take that next step. Well, my kids are young. I don't have a lot of time. I didn't come from a Christian background. All kinds of stuff. All of that is an unwillingness, a hesitation. Um, in the Bible, there's a prophet Elijah who went to hear from God. So he looked for God in the fire. God didn't speak in the fire. There was a earthquake. God didn't speak in the earthquake. A rushing wind. God didn't rush in the wind. The Bible says that God spoke to him in a still, small voice. So when you're praying and that little thing's in the back of your head, hey, hey, this is it, this is it. Push that, that's what that is. So the first step to a spiritual disaster is not heeding the still, small voice. Yeah. That's all it takes. Doesn't seem like a big step, does it? It's a hesitation. God wants you to move when he says move. Not he says move and then you think about it for 10 years. And try to time. <laughs> this is a guy in my first church, 83 years old. Had a stroke. His wife developed Alzheimer's. He'd become combative. But after he had 83 years old, he told me, well, I'm, I'm ready to fully surrender to the Lord. He was already a Christian. He'd come to church every Sunday. Well, now I'm really ready to fully surrender to the Lord. I'm thinking, it's a little late now. A little late. Now, is it good? Yeah, it's good. His name was Bob. I didn't ask him this. I had him 63 years ago. At age 20. When God was speaking to you that there's something that he wanted you to do. Time flies like that, folks. Amen. Well, I'll just hesitate. There's a guy at age 40 finally, finally surrendered to youth ministry. It's a little late. Well, God was telling him at 18, that's when you should have done it. That window's passed, but it's, you know, not many people out there looking for youth pastors my age. I was a youth pastor when Abraham Lincoln was president. That's what it feels like. <laughs> Move at the mention to multiply the masses. Diagram of spiritual disaster. It's just hesitation, refusal. Nevertheless, you would not go up. And then and the next is rebellion. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. So first you hesitate, you refuse, and then you rebel. Just a small step, but it is a next step. And often at this step, not only do you rebel against them, but you're kind of aggravated when other people are surrendering and doing great things for God. And then there's rumor, verse 27. It says, you grumbled in your tents and say, the Lord brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites, order to destroy us because he hates us. You think that's really true? So God sent Moses back here to free us out of slavery, which we've been in for 400 years. He's beaten and made to make bricks without straw. And then he liberates from that, us from that, opens the Red Sea, walks around dry land. He, he did all that just to kill you? That doesn't make any sense. And then God provided a manna from heaven so that they may eat. But you see, when you hesitate, when you refuse to do what God wants you to do, and then you rebel... Then you start the room. I haven't even heard this about church. Well, that church over there, they must, there's so many people coming to that church, they must water down the gospel. No. It's that rebellion. And that room. How about you? When you see God lighten it up and doing things that cannot be explained by human means, you start trashing it. When you start rejoicing in it, that's an indication of where your heart is. And then ruin is imagined, verse 27, which isn't true. Then you give reasoning, emotional and physical. But it really comes down to a spiritual commitment to you. So verse 29, the Bible says, Then I said to you, don't be terrified or afraid of me. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son, and all the way that you went until you came to this place. So I'm to the point in my life where I believe, and I I have those times of hesitation. 
I have those times where do I really want to do it again? Do I really have what it takes to do it again? That happens to me on a regular basis. And you know what I think that comes down to? It's fear. Fear. So God's done some things in my life. But what if it doesn't happen next time? Right? Why don't I just depend on what he's already done? So even when we got that second location for Stowe, Stowe Mission, for a second, so we had the first location. I was praying about it, told everybody we need to get another one. This guy asked me, you already have one. Do you really need to do another one? Yes, I do. I can't live like that. Being okay with what happened before. But it's fear. Am I going to be able to raise the money? I don't know. I got some ideas, but that, you can't cash those at the bank. Right? I got what I believe God wants me to do. And I think it might be fear for you. you look through the Bible... Like even the parable of the talents, he gave one, one of his slaves five talents, one of them two, one of them one. The guy with five doubled his, got ten. The guy with two doubled his, got two more, four. The guy with one buried it. Here's what he said. I was afraid. I buried it. You can't multiply what you bury. You gotta risk it. You gotta let it. What about your life? Are you willing to go for it? You don't have to have any special training. You don't have to. You can get that as you go along if you need it. I got a lot of training because I needed more help than most people, right? But I couldn't figure it out. So. It's none of that. There's no reason you shouldn't take that step. There's no reason under heaven why you shouldn't become a believer. People have arguments, but never let somebody with an argument uh, argue against somebody with experience. Right? Never met a believer that regretted it. I've never met somebody that got involved with ministry and regret the fact that they leveraged their life and let God use it. All these things that I see God do, he could have done it through somebody else, but I would have missed it if I weren't willing to risk it. So that's the question on the table. You're going to risk it. So being saved means risking your current life, right, what you're learning, for what God wants. You know, you get, I mean, you, you go to heaven rather than hell, that's a good deal. And But every day it gives you purpose. Every day I get up, my feet hit the ground, I'm, here I go. Because I know he saved me, and I know he has a purpose for my life, and I'm living it out. That's great. I love my life. I love difficult things. Right? I could go down a long list of those. But I can tell you it's worth it. And I can tell you it's worth it to become a Christian, but it's worth it to be involved in ministry, uh, to see God do things that you never could have done. Hallelujah. This church, I'm grateful for Pastor Tony. God used me a little bit. Nothing like he makes it out to be. But that, is, that will bless me beyond my lifetime. But I had some small part in this church. I try every day to do stuff like that, right? Got all these churches and all that. But it's a continual releasing of that fear when I show up for an African service that ends up being four hours long, and they put the, they don't take up offering like you guys. Like you guys have them come to the front, give them baskets, go to the back. They got one they put in the middle, and then row by row, they, well, they're, they're all dancing the whole way. <laughs> row by row, everybody walks by, right? And you better have something to put in there. So they did their it was a Saturday night service. They did their uh, fundraiser for their church. So here's the way they do it. All right? Anybody that's going to give $3,000 to this building, come up here right now. $3,000. Look for them. Five people to go up there. All right. Here they are. See them. Pray for them. $2,000. $2,000. I'm all stand up there, pray over them. $1,000. What? The whole deal. I mean, just, you got to probably raise $60,000. That's like, wow, right? <laughs> now, I'm not recommending you do that. You'd probably get killed in some church, right? But if I weren't willing to go into cultures that I know little about, 
to love people that I can't even speak their language, to eat food I've never eaten before, that I know what I have. So I'll be out to eat with some of these guys, and I'll bring a friend, or the guy's like, well, what is that? I have no idea. <laughs> well, you can tell them. I don't need to know. Why would I need to know that? Very good. Okay. So I'd like for you to stand with me right now. So if you're not a believer, you won't see God use you because you're not a believer. You're not a child of God until you trust Him, until you confess your sin, Turn away, repent of your sin, and trust Jesus Christ alone for salvation. There's no doubt. Slam dunk every time you say. Right? There's no. Nothing. I've never met anybody who didn't have a better life as a believer than they did as an unbeliever. And then if you're a believer, Lord, what is in that set? You guys have, it's more than double the size of the church you have now. That's an opportunity to reach all kinds of people. So how does God want to use you? What is that step over fear? Maybe it's the step to the neighbor's house that you're inviting them to church. This is, a, this is an easy church to invite people to, right? A lot of things are happening. God's doing a lot of them. Or maybe it's a step into a small group that you're a believer, you've been baptized, you, you love the worship here, which is incredible, by the way, to, to get involved with the people that can help you grow as a believer. And then if you're already doing that, maybe it's a step to take to become a leader. So the church where I was before had about 100 people in my Bible study class. They hear a speech about every spring. If you've been coming to class, I love you coming. If you've been here about two years, it's time for you to find your spot. So every fall, I'd have about 20 people sitting on those front, front chairs, pray over them, send them out into ministry, preschool ministry, children's ministry, youth ministry, choir, whatever it was. Don't make a monument out of the moment. Move towards the masses. Let God multiply your life in a way that cannot be calculated by you. Let's bow our heads. So if God wants you to be saved, come on up here. Just walk right up to the front. Pastor Tony be here. I'll be here. Just come on up. We're going to be singing. I invite you to come. And if you're a believer, I'd like for you to pray right now, right this second, just silently right where you are.